1947, Lydia Sleppy worked at KOAT Radio in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She received a call from John McBoyle, the general manager at the radio station in Roswell. She recalls McBoyle telling her that a flying saucer had crashed down north of Roswell. The next thing Sleppy knows, a message comes in, and it reads, this is the FBI. You will immediately cease all communication. Roswell, once just a sleepy city in New Mexico, is now the epicenter of UFO conspiracy theories. And it all started 70 years ago. Roswell encapsulates all of the reasons why the UFO phenomenon has had to be secret. It pinpoints the moment it was decided that the public cannot know the truth about UFOs. And in the decades after America's best known UFO incident, allegations of alien phenomena skyrocketed. Along with reports that the government knew more than they let on, and we're covering it all up. If the United States Air Force did recover alien bodies, they didn't tell me about it either, and I want to know. But if the government did ever find proof, would they tell us? Those people making national security decisions were probably justified to say, we are not going to tell the world about this just yet. And how far might they go to conceal it? When you get that kind of first-hand look at how these cover-ups work, you're going to be hungry for the truth. Between eyewitness accounts of UFOs and government reports that attempt to debunk them, where does the real truth lie? <laughs> July 1947, Roswell, New Mexico. William Mac Brazel, a rancher, contacts local authorities to report an unusual find. He claims to have discovered the debris of a strange aircraft scattered across the desert near the Roswell Airfield. The sheriff didn't know what to make of this, so he called the Roswell Army Airfield and asked if they knew anything about a strange aircraft that had just crashed in Roswell. The Army acts quickly to secure the scene and remove the strange crash materials. And there were other reports of a second crash where extraterrestrial bodies were allegedly found. A nurse at the Roswell Army Base morgue even provided illustrations of what she supposedly saw. The story was also picked up by the local newspaper. And it actually said that the intelligence office of the Roswell Army Airfield, quote, announced at noon today that the field has come into possession of a flying saucer. The potential impact of this discovery is far-reaching and is immediately brought to the attention of President Harry S. Truman. When the Roswell crash report hit Truman's desk, Truman considered it significant enough to send one of his top generals, General Nathan Twining, to Roswell to do the accident investigation report. General Twining, a celebrated war hero and head of research and development for the Air Force, would later go on to become chairman of the Joint Chiefs. You're gonna have to ask yourself, well, why would Twining go there? We have leaked documents, which have been disputed, but I think are legitimate. And what they indicate is that what Twining found was that what crashed at Roswell was something not from us. It was technology not made by human hands. General Nathan Twining made a recommendation that a formal study of UFOs be conducted and that it be kept secret for the well-being of the public and, of course, national security. But, of course, the problem with that is that secrecy develops its own momentum, its own bureaucracy, its own power. And then, of course, it's gone. There's no chance. The longer that secret goes, the less likely it'll ever be that you'll want to reveal it. Some believe that secret is sealed forever when the military provides its official response to the Roswell rumors. As part of President Truman's effort to cover up the Roswell crash, he gave instructions to top generals in Washington, who then gave instructions to General Roger Ramey to put an end to the Roswell stories. 
the material, whatever was uh, captured at Roswell, was then sent off to uh, Wright Field for analysis at Air Material Command. But on its way, they stopped off at Roger Ramey's headquarters in Texas. And this was where uh, photographers took pictures of poor Jesse Marcel standing with this uh, like aluminum foil balloon made to look like a fool. And Ramey was in charge of that whole thing, basically telling the uh, press that it was only a weather balloon. It was a mistaken identity. That was the government's official explanation for Roswell, a downed research balloon. Perfectly logical mistake. End of story. But 30 years after the Roswell crash, a military insider finally comes forward and publicly confirms what many have suspected for decades. In 1980, Major Jesse Marcel, an intelligence officer at Roswell Airfield, admitted that 30 years earlier he was asked to exchange the remnants of the crashed UFO with the remnants of a crashed research balloon to be used for the photographs of the story in the newspaper. They had the picture made strictly for the press. Those photos were taken while the actual wreckage was on its way to Wright Field. For the press, that was the end of the story. For ufologists, it was the beginning of a government UFO conspiracy. This kind of disinformation might seem like par for the course these days, but this is actually really significant. It pinpoints the moment it was decided that the public cannot know the truth about UFOs. But many researchers suggest there may have been legitimate justification for concealing the truth about Roswell. The Cold War was ramping up, and the mood of the nation was one of great concern and worry. And now you have this. You have this whole thing. A, you don't know who these other beings are. You don't know what their intentions are. You really don't know anything about them, except that they're not us. And so it's this tremendous unknown. Think about this. We're talking about a topic that is of explosive, explosive potentiality here. A very common reaction that people are going to have is panic. And most of us in our worlds, we have our, our little you know, bubble of reality. This, this doesn't intrude. But what if it does intrude? Then boom, there goes whole, your whole worldview. I think that in those early years, those people making national security decisions were probably justified to say, we are not going to tell the world about this just yet. So Roswell encapsulates in a neat <laughs> real package all of the reasons why the UFO phenomenon has had to be secret. In the wake of Roswell, President Truman issues directives that many believe were aimed at further concealing America's UFO secrets. One of the things he did was form the National Security Act, 1947, which established the CIA. The CIA was allowed to look into the UFO situation. He also combined the four military forces and put them under the new Secretary of Defense, who was James Forrestal. Forrestal was an exceedingly intelligent man. A guy who'd been around the block of life many times, knew a lot and dealt with incredible amounts of pressure during World War II. Washington, D.C., 1947. Two months after the Roswell incident, President Truman instructs his new Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal, to create a classified group tasked with managing the UFO secret. This group is allegedly known as Majestic 12. There is one uh, leaked document, the, one of the Majestic 12 documents, that is a memo from President Harry Truman to Secretary Forrestal, authorizing the creation of this group, MJ-12. The memo allegedly reads, quote, as per our recent conversation on this matter, you are hereby authorized to proceed with all due speed and caution upon your undertaking. Hereafter, this matter shall be referred to only as Operation Majestic 12. Majestic 12 was a group of 12 scientists, military people, government officials, who were given the task of accumulating the material 
controlling the UFO material, keeping the secrecy, doing the disinformation, and everything else that would be necessary. Some believe that the members of Majestic 12 are the founding fathers of America's shadow government, a top secret faction with no accountability to the public. The members of MJ-12, first of all, they were not elected. Obviously, they were selected. So there were no like public politicians or anything like that. And I think that's important, because what you really don't want in a secret UFO control group is to have a public official to be part of it, simply for the fact that they're going to have a real conflict of interest here. First of all, they're going to have to live a whole life of lying to their constituency. Not a good idea. What you really want is plausible deniability. But from the very start, there are rumblings of dissent among Truman's secret keepers. Right in the formation, the beginning of Majestic 12, the Secretary of Defense Forrestal was totally against the secrecy of UFOs. According to UFO research files, James Forrestal soon clashes with the very group he helped create. He believed that the people had the right to know, which kind of put him in the path of the secret government. Reportedly, as Forrestal's disagreements with the shadow government increase, he also begins to display increasingly erratic behavior. This was a guy who really had it together. And then suddenly, during 1947 and 48, he unraveled. And it was a very, very tense period of time. Many suggest that Forrestal's downward spiral may be related to an event that occurred shortly after the Roswell UFO crash. 1947, Wright Field. Rumors surface that the base is in possession of alien bodies recovered from Roswell. There are reports about an alien autopsy conducted on bodies pulled from the Roswell crash. And there are also some claims that James Forrestal was present for this autopsy. According to one account, Forrestal touched the alien body on the autopsy table, and as soon as he made contact, he reported a severe buzzing sound in his head. After that, he would get an intense migraine anytime he got close to the body. Out of the small group present in that room, Forrestal was the only person who experienced this. Some people believe that this encounter affected Forrestal. He fell apart. He fell apart psychologically. Something happened to James Forrestal. People who knew him said, what's, what's wrong with, with Jim? March 1949, less than two years after being appointed America's first Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal tenders his resignation. And some believe that the remaining members of Majestic 12 are concerned that their secrets are now at risk. If one of your top guys is not reliable, you've got to do something about it. That's a security risk that is beyond anything you can imagine. So I think that's why he had to be taken out. Allegations surrounding the infamous Roswell UFO crash of 1947 propose a cover-up at the highest levels of government. And many believe that this is the catalyst for President Harry S. Truman's creation of secret government groups like Majestic 12, which were designed to investigate and perhaps suppress UFO sightings. But according to reports, all is not well as Secretary of Defense James Forrestal is on a collision course with the very group he helped create. It has, in fact, been suggested that Forrestal was uh, kind of a renegade on MJ-12, disagreeing with the overall secrecy policy. It was ironic that he set it up, and then in the end, he realized that it was something that was completely getting out of control and that he couldn't control it anymore. But according to witnesses, Forrestal's strange behavior continued even after his resignation. Forrestal was feeling more and more paranoid and isolated. He even thought that there were foreign-looking people following him. He was becoming unstable, becoming unhinged. And I think that was really the biggest problem with Jimmy Forrestal, is that you couldn't really rely on him. Th this is a phenomenon, a topic, that required the absolute top-level control. And if one of your top guys is not reliable, you've got to do something about it. That's a security risk that is beyond anything you can imagine. 
So I think that's why he had to be taken out. Five days later, the former Secretary of Defense is admitted to the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. Forrestal is held at the hospital for over a month. His brother calls and says, you know, you're holding my brother here for too long. I'm going to get him. I'm coming in tomorrow to get him. But Forrestal's brother arrives at the hospital too late. That night, James Forrestal fell or leaped or was thrown out of the 16th floor window at the Bethesda Naval Hospital and fell to his death. Since the death occurred on a naval facility, local police didn't investigate the suicide. Instead, the head of the Naval Board of Inquiry immediately announced it was absolutely certain that Forrestal's death could be nothing else than a suicide. But there are clues that may suggest a more sinister possibility. What they didn't mention was that his attending physician and the night orderly were off that night, and scuff marks were found at the base of the window, suggesting signs of a struggle. Is it possible that James Forrestal was murdered for threatening to expose the shadow government's UFO secrets? But keep in mind, this is 14 years before the Kennedy assassination. Who in America is going to question the United States Navy investigation of this. So whatever they were going to say is what was going to go and play for the media. And that's exactly what happened. No one questioned it. After that happened, everybody else in Majestic 12, you know, kept their mouth shut. However, in the wake of Forrestal's death, it becomes increasingly difficult for the government to control reports of UFO sightings, which increased dramatically in the next few years. In the early 1950s, the number of sightings actually doubled every month. One such sighting allegedly occurred at a military installation in Forest, Ohio, the very same base where the Roswell debris and alleged life forms were supposedly stored back in 47. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, 1955. During the 1940s and 50s, a woman named Norma Gardner works in the Foreign Materials Division at Wright-Patterson. Over the course of a year, Norma Gardner catalogs approximately 1,000 different items from UFO crashes. Now, she photographs and tags each one. Now, one day, she witnesses a cart being moved from one room to another. and on that cart are dead alien bodies. They appear to be between four and five feet tall, and their eyes are narrow and slanted. As a military employee, Norma Gardner is sworn to secrecy, but she eventually breaks her silence. It's on her deathbed that she confesses her story. She claims, Uncle Sam can't do anything to me once I'm in my grave. About six months later, she passed away. And Norma's story about Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is not an isolated one. In 1966, another government employee, known only as JK, is working there as a computer missile specialist on the Nike missile program with top security clearance. JK finds himself on many occasions at wright Pat. One of these times, he's escorted to an underground facility on the base that is inaccessible without top-level security. Inside this facility, he sees nine glass cases. The glass appears to be about an inch thick, and each case is illuminated. And he can see that inside the cases are nine bodies. Is Wright-Patterson Air Force Base the final resting place for aliens recovered from crash sites? Or, at the very least, could it be some sort of receiving station? Rumors suggest the answers reside in a special section of the base. It was always believed that all the UFOs, the, 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 the bodies, even aliens, they were all brought to Hangar 18 for analysis. In fact, the late Senator Barry Goldwater, who had a secret clearance, he tried to get into the UFO material at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Barry Goldwater was a United States senator. He once ran for president back in 1964. And he was a very good personal friend of Air Force legend General Curtis LeMay. One time, he asked General LeMay about it. And as Goldwater said several times, 
It was the only time in their friendship that LeMay cussed him out and said, don't ever ask me about that again. Hangar 18's never really been confirmed. Most people now, I would say, think that it's probably a symbolic location. But there is report after report of eyewitnesses who either worked at Wright-Patterson or who were visiting the base and witnessed some sort of similar evidence. It makes you wonder how many aliens the government has actually recovered. And have they ever come across live aliens? August 1980. A civilian named Martin claims that his friend, an Air Force colonel, has information about live aliens in custody at none other than Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Martin and this colonel would get together on several occasions and speculate about UFOs and aliens. This conversation was always very casual, but Martin suspected that this man knew more than what he was saying. The last time the colonel would speak with Martin, he informs Martin that he's dying of cancer and there's something he wants to get off his chest first. That's when the colonel tells Martin that there are two live aliens at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The colonel dies three weeks after his conversation with Martin. Decades after Roswell, countless stories from government and military personnel collectively report similar findings that living, breathing aliens have been held at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. After Roswell, a pattern of alien eyewitness reports begins to emerge. The most notable case involving the government's own Secretary of Defense, James Forstall, resulted in his swift resignation and mysterious death. Could this have been the first instance of a witness being forcibly silenced? Stories of the men in black have been part of UFO lore since the early 1950s. Unidentified men who use fear and intimidation to threaten UFO witnesses. Their identity remains a mystery. Everyone's heard of the men in black because the concept has become so ingrained in our pop culture. But if you look into their history, the men in black are a lot more mysterious and frightening than what you might see on the movie screen. The whole idea about the men in black is who are they? Who are they working for? Why would they show up just to tell people to keep quiet about their UFO experience? Though their identity is still unknown, reports of their appearance after alleged UFO encounters go back for decades. One such report illustrates just how far they may be willing to go. It doesn't matter if you're a four-star general or an average Joe on the street, anyone can become a target. Louisiana, 1983. Shortly after moving to a new town, Mike Reynolds strikes up a conversation that will change his life forever. One of the first people Mike meets is a retired Air Force major. They hit it off right away. Eventually, the major reveals that he had spent his entire military career working at the infamous Area 51 in Nevada. At the time, Area 51 is believed by many to be a hub of extraterrestrial reverse engineering. Of course, the major was sworn to secrecy about Area 51 when he was in the military, but now that he's getting older, he's starting to have mixed feelings about his work out there. Well, Mike is very interested in this, and the major takes him aside and starts to spill the beans on everything. Suddenly, Mike is getting an earful of highly classified secrets. The major tells Mike that Area 51 houses recovered alien UFOs and that the military has been reverse engineering this technology for years. And then he tells Mike that he's written a manuscript that is going to reveal everything. It hits Mike. This is his calling. He's going to help the major publish his expose and tell the world the truth about UFOs. Mike offers to buy the publishing rights on the spot. With the major's rights secured, Mike schedules a series of media appearances. Mike books a local radio interview. But the night before the interview, the station manager calls to tell Mike 
about a disturbing encounter with a group of men in black suits. These men in black showed up at the radio station and told the manager to cancel the interview. They didn't identify themselves as representing any specific agency. They simply told the manager to cancel the interview and they did it in a very threatening way. The intimidation works and the interview is canceled. Mike is unsettled by the station manager's story, but not enough to quit. He's still gonna get this book published. And a few days later, Mike heads off to Houston to meet with a friend in publishing. While driving to Houston, Mike soon notices two black cars that appear to be following him. The drive is almost 300 miles, but every time Mike looks in his rearview mirror, those same two cars are on his tail. That evening, Mike arrives at his Houston hotel, but before he can even check in, he is stopped. He's heading into his hotel. He's got to get ready for his big meeting the next day, when two men wearing black business suits appear out of nowhere. The men do not identify themselves. They stare into Mike's eyes and coldly declare that he is not to publish the book. In many of these encounters, men in black are described as having an almost robotic way of speaking, stoic to the point and repetitive. Now, does this mean there's something inhuman about them? Or are these mannerisms another tool of psychological intimidation? After a few minutes of this weird encounter, the men leave. Mike feels slightly dazed. He doesn't seem to remember actually seeing them walk or drive away. They're just sort of gone. He checks into his room, and a few hours later, he remembers that he left the Major's manuscript in the trunk of his car. Mike walks out to the parking lot to grab the manuscript. He opens his trunk, and it's gone. But when he turns around, that's when he gets the real surprise. The men in black are right there, almost pinning Mike against his car. And this time, they tell Mike in no uncertain terms, stop your actions or your family will suffer. And that's when Mike decides to take their advice. He abandons the project and heads home. The Major must have been paid a visit, too, because when Mike returns home, the Major won't speak to him about anything, and his manuscript is never published by anyone. We see this time and time again, and they know how to expertly target witnesses. They will continue to escalate, and in this case, threatening a man's family until they get what they want. In the end, it's all the same. There's an ultimate authority that is very invested in denying the public our right to know the truth about UFOs. I can only imagine how deep this goes and how big these secrets are that they're protecting. But what happens when one of the largest states in the country becomes a hotbed for UFO activity? Is it possible to silence the entire Lone Star State? In the wake of Roswell, there are countless reports which suggest that the ultimate truth about UFOs may not be that they don't exist, but rather that they are a tightly guarded secret, aggressively controlled by an elite inner circle of bureaucrats, scientists, and military experts who answer to no one but themselves. But throughout the 1950s, these reports become increasingly difficult to control as the number of sightings continues to rise. There was a huge upswing in UFO reports across the United States. Starting in May of 1952, the number of sightings actually doubled every month. It went from 79 official UFO reports in May to over 700 in August. In 1952, another government organization called Project Blue Book is created to conduct studies on cases involving unidentified flying objects. General Nathan Twining authorizes a program that became known as Project Blue Book. That was really the first Air Force study of the flying saucer phenomenon. But some charge that Project Blue Book is actually a cover, a creation of Majestic 12 with a secret mandate to discredit credible UFO sightings. 
If this is true, that strategy is put to its biggest test when a slew of UFO sightings begin to crop up all over the state of Texas. Level in Texas, November 2nd, 1957. Two immigrant farm workers, Pedro Salcedo and Joe Salas, called the Leveland Police Department regarding a UFO sighting. Pedro and Joe are driving four miles west of Leveland when they see a blue flash of light near the road. Suddenly, their engine dies and the vehicle rolls to a stop. At that moment, a strange object approaches them. When it got near, the lights of my vehicle went out and the motor died. I jumped out and hit dirt because I was afraid. I called to Joe, but he didn't get out. A thin pass directly over me, but a great sound and a rush of wind. It sounded like thunder, and my vehicle rocked from the blast. I felt a lot of heat. Then I got up and watched it go out of sight towards Leftland. When the object moves away from the vehicle, the engine restarts. Saucedo immediately calls the police, and Officer A.J. Fowler answers. Officer Fowler thinks he's dealing with a crank call, so he ignores it. But an hour later, he gets another call. A man named Jim Wheeler is driving four miles east of Leveland when he reports a brilliantly lit, egg-shaped object sitting in the road, blocking his path. Like Pedro, Wheeler claims his vehicle dies. As he gets out of the car, the object takes off and its lights disappear. Once again, the car restarts after the object is gone. First, Pedro and Joe, then Jim Wheeler. Then the calls just start rolling in. A married couple driving northeast of Leveland, a motorist 11 miles north of town. A Texas Tech college student 10 miles east of town. Boom, boom, boom. The calls keep coming. All of these motorists have similar stories. A strange object in the road, their engines cut out. When the object flies off, their engines start up again. Officer Fowler alerts on-duty officers of the situation. The local sheriff and one of his deputies begin monitoring Officer Fowler's reports and tracking the object. Around 1.30 AM, they have their own encounter. A large glowing object passes across the highway in front of them. The officers claim the entire highway is lit up below the sun-like object. The Leveland Police Department received a total of 15 calls that night, and reports would continue to trickle in for the next several days. This sounds like an EMP to me, an electromagnetic pulse weapon that shuts down motors. It doesn't kill the people. They're showing us that they're here. They want us to know that they're here. The local newspaper runs the story, which is then picked up nationwide. Project Blue Book then dispatches an Air Force sergeant to investigate. The Air Force sergeant heard that there had been thunderstorms in the surrounding area earlier that morning. He decided to focus on this and announced that a phenomenon called ball lightning had occurred. Basically is what it sounds like. It's a glowing ball of light and electrical discharge and energy. If you've ever seen like a plasma ball in the store, that's sort of, I think, a good image for what it is. But not everyone is convinced of the Air Force's official findings. Dr. J. Allen Hynek was an astronomer at Northwestern University and one of the top scientific consultants to Project Blue Book. After doing his own investigation, he claimed the sightings could not be attributed to ball lightning. First of all, ball lightning is not very large, but in each of the sightings, the object was big enough to block the road. Second, ball lightning is not known to have the ability to shut off car engines. Despite what the Air Force sergeant heard, there was no rain or lightning in the vicinity of Leveland at the time of the sightings. It appears the military's report does not reflect all the facts of the case. Despite these omissions, the case is closed. And this famed Texas story takes on even greater importance in light of an event that happened just six years earlier. Lubbock, Texas, August 25th, 1951. 
three scientists from Texas Tech University gathered together one hot summer evening. The men have actually gotten together to study meteors, so their eyes are trained on the sky. Suddenly, they see 20 to 30 bright lights, roughly the size of dinner plates, flying in a U formation. The objects are moving fast across the sky. The men immediately rule out the objects as meteors, and as they're discussing what the lights might be, another group of lights, similar to the first, flies overhead. The professors reach out to the Air Force for answers, but receive word that no traffic, to their knowledge, was in the air that night. The men then report their findings to the local newspaper. Once their story is published in the newspaper, multiple witnesses start coming forward with similar stories. Very bright, very big lights arranged in a boomerang formation, flying across the sky and never making a sound. Numerous public sightings of the lights continue from August to November of 1951. The professors decide to investigate further by creating a schedule to watch the skies. Hundreds observe the lights, and at one point, there are as many as three flights in one night. Then, on the night of August 30th, new evidence is captured of the Lubbock lights. A Texas Tech student by the name of Carl Hart Jr. attempts to photograph the lights. He witnesses two different flights that night, one at 5.30 p.m. and the other around 10.30 p.m. He takes photos both times with his 35 millimeter camera. The photos show anywhere from 18 to 20 lights arranged in a boomerang formation. The local newspaper publishes the photos and they begin circulating throughout the country. When I was a kid, one of the first images of UFOs that I ever saw were the Lubbock lights. And I thought, this was amazing. Eventually, the Air Force gets their hands on the photos. They're actually given to Captain Edward Ruppelt. Edward J. Ruppelt was a US Air Force captain. He's most famous as being the head of Project Blue Book. The Air Force had had several investigative bodies that investigated UFOs going back to 1947. First one being Project Sign, which went up until 1949, which was then succeeded by Project Grudge. And then 1952, that became Project Blue Book. Captain Ruppelt, now working under Project Grudge, travels to Lubbock to investigate further. He finds a local man who mentions seeing one night the reflection of the newly installed city streetlights bouncing off the white bellies of a few plover birds flying by. This gives Ruppelt and the Air Force a natural phenomenon to explain away the sightings, and they jump on it. They issue a statement that the newly installed vapor streetlights were bouncing off the undersides of the birds as they flew overhead. Case closed. In an effort to test this theory, a photographer at the local paper attempts to recreate Hart's photos using plover birds flying over the city at night. But the photos are nowhere close to those taken by Hart, as the reflections off the birds are far too dim. A federal wildlife game warden also rules out the plovers as a cause of the sightings. He notes that the birds can only fly around 50 miles per hour, much slower than the movements of the lights. Not to mention the fact that you can hear the birds when they fly. The residents of Lubbock are also not satisfied by the Air Force's findings and demand answers, but they hit a dead end. To this day, no one can truly explain what the lights were or where they came from. From government denials and secrecy to witness suppression, there is a 70-year history of allegations involving UFO reports and their subsequent cover-ups. But nearly 20 years after the Roswell crash and almost 1,700 miles away, another UFO crash, this time involving an entire town of eyewitnesses, pushes the envelope of factuality when the government supposedly tries to rewrite history once again. December 5th, 1965, Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. 
Dozens of eyewitnesses report a UFO streaking across the sky over Canada, Michigan, and Ohio. The FAA logs sightings from 23 pilots along the UFO's flight path. Finally, the residents of Kecksburg, Pennsylvania observe a fiery object plummeting from the sky and into the woods. People in town describe seeing this fireball-shaped object, and that suddenly changes course and crashes in the, in the wood line. A lot of people went out to the woods to investigate, and they got there first before anybody else did. A couple of the guys described it as a acorn shape that was embedded into the dirt, and there was a outside circumference, what they would describe resembled Egyptian hieroglyphics. In the middle of the scene, a local reporter, John Murphy, is capturing the events with his camera. John Murphy was a reporter and news director for WHJB, a radio station in nearby Greensburg, Pennsylvania. So while this is going on, he's snapping pictures of everything. John Murphy was just snapping away, taking pictures of the object. The military shows up and tells him, this is now a restricted area. You guys are ordered out of here. They confiscated his camera, and they told everybody to get the hell off the property. They were all pushed back, and all the military trucks pulled in. This is a small town, a few miles from where I live. There were dozens of witnesses on the street. The Army brought in a flatbed and did a crash and retrieval, and then they left. The official government report on this incident states that only three members of the military were sent to investigate the scene. The Kecksburg crash of 1965, that's a perfect example of this disparate nature between what officially happened and then what really happened. A team of three individuals go investigate it, and that's all she wrote. What everyone in the town of Kecksburg knows is that an enormous number of people, military, different types of branches of the military, probably over 100 uh, outside people came in combed the woods, sealed off the woods from the public. And yet what's interesting is that there's no official acknowledgement by the military services that they did this type of a thing. Think about it. You see something happen with your own eyes. You know hundreds of military personnel swarmed a small town, yet this is outright denied by the government. When you get that kind of first-hand look at how these cover-ups work, you're going to be hungry for the truth. So now the town was just sitting around with all these rumors of what the heck is going on. Kecksburg buzzes with stories about the mysterious object in the woods. And John Murphy, the reporter at the scene, decides to investigate. But the official story ends here, with authorities denying that any UFO was involved. The fallen object is reported to the press as a meteorite but no meteorites or fragments were recovered from the scene. The Kecksburg case is important, I think, because it involved the landing or crashing of a physical object. So it means that there is a physical object. It was taken away by the military and put somewhere. And there aren't that many UFO cases that involve something physical like that. Leaving John Murphy and other witnesses to wonder what became of the evidence? So the fact that all these people witnessed a physical object come down, some saw it in the woods on the ground, others saw it on the flatbed truck being taken away, means that there is a huge evidential thing that the US government has somewhere. So you have this very black and white contradiction between what the official line was and what actually happened. However, the journalist at the scene, John Murphy, is determined to uncover the truth. But what happens when one man's search for answers challenges the government's own findings as he attempts to unveil the suspected cover-up? Behind the story of a 1965 UFO crash in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, 
Reports describe a UFO seized by the military and the subsequent suppression of all evidence until a local reporter threatens the government cover-up. 1965, John Murphy begins gathering evidence on the Kecksburg crash. John Murphy decided to do a radio documentary. But what he needed to do was go around and talk to all the witnesses to get all the pieces of the story together. The reporter believes that the government's account is in contradiction to actual eyewitness reports. Right away, Murphy notices something. There are many witnesses, yet their descriptions of the UFO are consistently similar. And this wasn't a typical flying saucer. This was a very specific kind of craft with unusual details. John Murphy actually feels like he's on the verge of something here, and he's pouring all his energy and effort into this radio broadcast. And he's telling all his friends that he's uncovered something huge. He conducts this thorough investigation and is about to reveal his findings to the world. And this is when things take a dark turn. Reportedly, on the evening before the radio documentary is to air, John Murphy receives some unannounced visitors. So two men show up at the radio station. They don't identify themselves as military or police or any type of investigator. John Murphy never disclosed what the men actually told him. But they clearly convinced him that it was in his best interest to keep quiet about the whole thing. Then they confiscated his recordings and other evidence he'd obtained. Murphy was forced to recut his documentary at the 11th hour, and the version that aired was a chilling testament to how badly these visitors had intimidated him. The documentary that airs is simply an account of a possible meteor strike. It contains no new evidence, makes no reference to the military, and does not mention a UFO. This guy is absolutely devastated. After pouring his heart and soul into a potentially world-changing investigation, he gets snatched away at the last minute. He loses his job and spends the next three years completely beaten down and dejected until he decides to do something about it. In 1967, Murphy reportedly confides to a friend that he wants to reopen his original investigation. John Murphy eventually convinced himself that this story had to be told, and apparently he no longer believed he was in any danger. But he was wrong. Two days after reportedly reopening his investigation into the Kecksburg crash, John Murphy crosses the street and is killed by a hit-and-run driver. The driver is never found. It's impossible to categorically state that he was killed because of what he knew about Kecksburg and to prevent him from disclosing his information. But it's certainly cause for alarm. John Murphy is far from being the only UFO whistleblower to die under mysterious circumstances. Fast acting cancers, car accidents, suicides, all way before their normal lifespan should have ended. James E. McDonald, he testified before Congress twice. He ends up dying of a suicide. John Mack, he gets hit by a car. John Murphy of the Kecksburg case, he gets hit by a car. It goes on and on. UFO investigators all meeting an early death. These mysterious and sometimes deadly circumstances lead many to wonder if there truly is a program in place to suppress information regarding UFOs. Countless reports on file point to the existence of a clandestine authority determined to control the country's UFO secrets. After Roswell and continued sightings by the public, the government establishes Project Blue Book, the Air Force's official investigation into UFOs. But some believe Project Blue Book's mission is actually to suppress UFO information. Air Force Officer Edward Ruppelt was running Project Blue Book at the time. It was a big debate. Do we clamp down? 
and just tell the public there's nothing to it? Or do we actually just fess up and say, look, there's this phenomenon going on here, and we're doing our best to deal with it? And it absolutely was clear that the decision was, we're clamping down. In one of Project Blue Book's most famous cases, an entire town reports a mass UFO sighting, only to experience a rapid cover-up firsthand. March 14th, 1966, the Sheriff's Department in Washtenaw County, Michigan, begins to log reports of unusual activity in the skies. Files from these sightings in Michigan in 1966 are filled with incredible eyewitness accounts. Police officers Buford Bushrow and John Foster receive reports of disc-like objects over the town. The officers respond to the calls and soon encounter the UFOs firsthand. These objects could move at fantastic speeds. We have no idea what these objects were or where they could have come from. This is the strangest thing that we have ever witnessed. The Sheriff's Department was getting calls from police in three neighboring counties. Everybody saw this activity, but nobody knew what it was. These accounts stretch over a period of six to seven days. The reports culminate with multiple sightings of a UFO landing in a nearby swamp. On March 20th, Frank Maynard, his family, and friends they saw a dome-shaped object with a quilted pattern to it, with a light in the center and lights around the ends, land in a swamp. Maynard and his son enter the swamp in search of the UFO. They are joined by sheriff's deputies. There's an incident where a guy named Maynard and his son were walking through a bog, chasing after a UFO and this UFO slowly rose above their heads and then shot off into the night sky. The officers were also a witness to the UFO over the swamp. They were amazed at the maneuverability of the UFO. Local authorities report the sighting to the Air Force. So what did the Air Force do? They sent their primary scientific consultant, the astronomer J. Allen Hynek, to Michigan to give a press conference. Dr. Hynek conducts an investigation and presents a controversial conclusion to the public. Hynek's on, on camera, he's got the microphones in front of him. And he said, well, what it appears to be is uh, decaying vegetable matter from the uh, swampy area, creating a kind of optical illusory effect, i.e. swamp gas, swamp gas. Keep in mind, these sightings were witnessed by many people across multiple counties on multiple days. And here's the government expert saying with a straight face that this was all just a shared hallucination. Now, this was too much even for the uh, American media, and swamp gas became this big joke. Dr. Hynek's work under Project Blue Book results in many reasonable and to some unreasonable conclusions. But it's the public outcry from the Michigan case that causes many to begin questioning the truth behind this research. What it really looks like to me, actually, is that in the aftermath of this, Hynek started to wonder, am I on the right side of this argument? Because really, he had been really doing the Air Force's work in a debunking type of capacity for years. And now suddenly, his debunking really made him look foolish. The official explanation is not acceptable to Michigan's local congressman and future president, Gerald R. Ford. Following the Michigan sightings, Gerald Ford, who was the congressman in Michigan, was very adamant that the explanation that was given by the US Air Force was insufficient. He went as far as to actually state that he wanted an, a congressional investigation, he wanted people to be subpoenaed, and he wanted people to testify under oath. For the first time, we had a high-level government official who was saying that there should be UFO disclosure. In response to Ford's demands, an official committee is formed to evaluate the effectiveness of Project Blue Book and the government's UFO investigations. It was at that point that Edward Condon was brought in at the University of Colorado 
to do what would appear to be an evaluation of U.S. Project Blue Book. But in fact, it was just a way to shut the program down. The problem with the Condon report was that Edward Condon was biased from the beginning. Just look at what he said to a scientific fraternity on January 25th. Quote, Unidentified flying objects are not the business of the Air Force. It's my inclination right now to recommend that the government get out of the business. My attitude right now is that there's nothing to it. But I'm not supposed to reach a conclusion for another year. But closing the chapter on Project Blue Book does not put an end to the government's involvement in UFO matters. Many believe that its agenda to conceal the truth about the alien phenomena remains fully intact. The federal government is going to give you exactly what they want you to hear. I don't think they're afraid of anything. They just want to control things because the government does not want this information to get out. There is a history of remarkable encounters involving the military and UFO sightings. And as seen in the Roswell case, once the military get involved in an alleged alien encounter, it can be difficult to weed out the truth. In 1978, I was working at McGuire Air Force Base at 21st Air Force as a deputy director of intelligence. On January 18th, 1978, I drove onto the base and noticed that off to my right was um, a number of uh, crash trucks and lights out on the runway. And the sergeant in charge of the command post came up to me and said that an alien has been found at the end of the runway, that he was shot by a military policeman. January 18th, 1978 between Fort Dix and McGuire Air Force Base. Radar from Fort Dix picks up an unidentified object between Fort Dix and McGuire Air Force Base. The military police officer on duty is patrolling the outside of the base when he sees a large object hovering over the road. He stops his car and radios in what he sees. He's looking up through his windshield through the falling snow and explaining to the dispatcher what the craft looks like right in the middle of a sentence. The radio goes dead. The officer looks up, and that's when he sees the unimaginable. A small figure in the shadows that he later describes as having an unusually large head, long arms, and a slender body. And this creature is standing right in front of his police car. The officer panics. Here's a man who is told to protect the base. He's an armed guard, and he's seeing a monster run around. He does what probably a lot of guys would do. He shoots at the thing. He runs back to his car, and his radio is now working again. He tells the dispatcher that he just shot a strange creature, and it's now headed for McGuire Air Force Base. The police officer drives to the gates of McGuire Air Force Base, where he is told to wait. Sergeant Jeffrey Morse from McGuire Air Force Base is called to the front gate to meet with the officer from Fort Dix to discuss the incident. The officer's really shaken up. He tells Morse that he shot at a strange entity, but it escaped and climbed over the fence into McGuire Air Force Base. Sergeant Morse says that he'll handle it from here. Sergeant Morris has to be thinking this other police officer is crazy, but he was about to get a big surprise. Morris and several other MPs head to the area where the entity reportedly climbed over the fence. At the end of the runway, they see a dead creature with a large head and slender body. Sergeant Morris can't believe his eyes. He reports that the smell is so bad they have to stand back several feet just to be able to breathe. He calls in a report, and within hours, the Air Force OSI takes control of the situation. 
AFOSI is the Air Force's Office of Special Investigations, and they report directly to the Office of Security to the Air Force. Technically, this means that they provide independent investigations outside the traditional military chain of command. Sergeant Morris reports that he is surprised to see a military team responding to the incident in a way that suggests this wasn't the first encounter like this they had dealt with. Sergeant Morse is not only brought in for questioning, but threatened. Morse went through several days of intimidating interrogations where he was told to keep his mouth shut or else. As incredible as the story sounds, it is corroborated by George Filer, who was brought in to investigate the incident. When I was investigating the case, I did interview Sergeant Jeff Morris, who claims to have been out at the uh, place where they found the ET. Within a couple days after he was out there, he was transferred to uh, Okinawa. They more or less arrested him and held him for a while and essentially gave him a hard time. Now, what happened to Jeffrey Morse in the aftermath of all this is kind of symptomatic of how military personnel were held to different standards of accountability than, say, civilian police officers had been. It's one thing for a small town cop to be ridiculed, but when you're a military person and you start talking privately to investigators about this, they're gonna come after you. It's almost as if the military learned from previous reports that if you remove the witness, the media and investigators don't have any leads. If this is the military's new protocol, how far will they go to keep the public in the dark? And does that protocol change when lives hang in the balance? When soldiers on the front lines are up against enemy fire, there is little time for anything but action. But no amount of training can prepare even the most skilled soldier for an aggressive alien attack. June 15, 1968, the demilitarized zone between North and South Vietnam. This incident happened at the height of the Vietnam War. On this night, Lieutenant Pete Snyder and the American crew of the patrol boat PCF-12 are starting their routine patrol near Qua Viet. At approximately 12.30 a.m., Snyder gets a frantic message from another patrol boat in the vicinity, PCF-19, which is commanded by Lieutenant Davis. Lieutenant Davis reports that they are under attack by unidentified objects, possibly enemy helicopters. At the time, the Vietnamese did not have helicopters. The term enemy helicopters is the military's code for UFOs. Lieutenant Snyder's boat proceeds at max speed towards Lieutenant Davis's location. And as they get closer, Snyder and his crew see two UFOs covered in a strange glow hovering above Davis's patrol boat. All of a sudden, there's a flash of light and an explosion and the boat is completely destroyed, blown to bits. In an instant, the UFOs zip out to sea and disappear. Can you imagine? You're in the middle of a war zone, worried about enemy fire, and then something as unbelievable as a UFO comes in and destroys one of your patrol boats. Now everyone on Snyder's boat is on high alert, aware the UFOs could return at any minute. The Navy instructs them to continue their patrol upriver, heading deeper into the DMZ. It is completely dark except for a partial moon. The patrol boat is observing radio silence. Suddenly, Jeff Steffes, the second engine man, sees two aircraft hovering off both the port and starboard sides of their boat. Lieutenant Snyder realizes these are the same UFOs that he spotted hovering over Davis's boat before the fateful attack. With the UFOs now closing in, Snyder is determined to protect his patrol boat and crew, so he orders all hands on deck to engage with the UFOs. The crew fires at the UFOs, but the objects aren't slowing down, and they keep coming closer. Snyder's boat is sprayed with ammunition from the UFOs. 
Lieutenant Snyder accelerates and whips the boat back and forth in an attempt to dodge the return fire from the spacecraft. The crew continues to shoot at the UFOs while their patrol boat is now trying to escape at full speed. Steffes, the second engine man, now gets a good look at the UFOs in the moonlight. He describes them as having a rounded front like an observation halo with what looks like two crewmen sitting side by side. But oddly, he can't see any weapons on the craft. Lieutenant Snyder, fearing what might happen next, turns his patrol boat back around towards the China Sea, where the US Naval Fleet is stationed. The UFOs are still in pursuit, and Snyder's boat is now running low on ammo and fuel. The radio is crackling with a flood of activity reporting engagements with unidentified objects. Could these strange aircraft be a new secret weapon provided by the Chinese or Soviet Union to aid the North Vietnamese? The military was interested in them because they had capabilities far above anything that we have, and they wanted to find out what the technology was and, frankly, who they belonged to. Unclear about what they are facing, the U.S. military takes action. At about 3.20 a.m., Phantom F-4 fighter jets are deployed from Da Nang to provide air support to Snyder's patrol boat. Soon, the Phantom F-4s are in hot pursuit of the UFOs. The two UFOs attacking Snyder's boat veer away at an amazing speed and head downriver toward the China Sea. Meanwhile, an allied ship of the Royal Australian Navy, HMAS Hobart, is also in the China Sea, and it too reports seeing 30 strange lights hovering close to their ship. The Hobart's commander radios in that two UFOs are rapidly approaching their boat. These may have been the same UFOs that have been attacking Snyder's boat. The U.S. Navy jets from Da Nang are still in hot pursuit of the two UFOs. The Phantom F-4s fire several missiles directly at the UFOs hovering over the Hobart. As soon as the jets fire the missiles, the objects just simply vanish into thin air. Just like that, they're gone. The threat to the Hobart and the U.S. fleet seems to be over. The jets return to Da Nang, and the DMZ is quiet. With the UFOs gone, the Navy assesses the damage. This wasn't a normal battle. In fact, the artillery rounds that the UFO shot at Snyder's boat turned out to be the exact same rounds that Snyder was shooting at the UFOs. It's mind boggling. This patrol boat discovers that it's being hit by the very same artillery that they're firing. This makes no sense. Could this simply be a case of friendly fire brought on by faulty radar or battle fatigue? Or is this incident an example of UFOs turning our own weapons against us? I was in the Air Force from 1958 to 1978. When I was in Vietnam, I used to brief uh, General George S. Brown every morning. We would get reports of unidentified aircraft. Well, I've heard many reports concerning some kind of a force field around the UFOs, that they have the capability of returning fire. If this is true, how are soldiers expected to defend themselves against UFOs? And what happens when the same UFOs return for more? The China Sea, Vietnam. Hobart continues its patrol near Tiger Island. The sky and water are eerily quiet. There were no signs of any UFOs or any enemy aircraft for that matter. Just before daybreak, a missile comes in from out of nowhere, no warning at all, and hits the Hobart's starboard side, killing Australian seaman R.J. Buttersworth and wounding two additional seamen. The Hobart crew runs up to their battle stations, and now they see two UFOs off their starboard side. But before they can respond, two more missiles are fired at their ship, killing their chief electrician. The missiles penetrate the ship's superstructure, causing extensive damage. 
The surviving crew from the Hobart gets a quick glance at the UFOs before they disappear, and they match the same description of the UFOs that attacked Lieutenant Snyder's boat earlier that evening. This is just insanity. In the middle of the Vietnam War, two boats are destroyed by UFOs, and another patrol boat barely escapes disaster. For whatever reason, these UFOs appear to be on an unrelenting mission. And these UFO incidents continued. About a week after the Hobart incident, an Australian newspaper reported that radar men five miles south of the DMZ were continuing to report UFOs. In fact, this was the sixth one since the Hobart attack that they had reported. Patrol boats continued to monitor UFOs well into September of that year. The U.S. Navy and the Royal Australian Navy launch a formal investigation. An investigation on the Hobart incident revealed that a fragment of one of the missiles fired on the patrol boat had a serial number that they were able to trace. And that number was traced back to missiles fired at the UFOs by the U.S. Phantom F-4, the same jet that was deployed from Da Nang Air Base the night before. The official report of proceedings filed on the Hobart incident concludes that it is a case of friendly fire. So you're thinking, OK, case closed. And Phantom F4 accidentally hit the wrong target. Except the facts aren't so cut and dry. The Phantom F4s had returned to their airbase in Da Nang immediately after their encounter with the UFOs, well before a missile had hit the Hobart. Years later, a military general comes forward with a surprising statement. General Brown said, from UFOs were seen up around the DMZ in 1968, and this resulted in quite a battle. An Australian boat took a hit and there was no enemy in sight. I think consistent with General Brown's statement, this 1968 encounter in the DMZ was probably the most significant UFO encounter of the Vietnam War. In two separate incidents in this encounter in Vietnam, we see UFOs that seem to have the capability to turn our own weapons against us. Those patrol boats were hit with our own weapons. How do you defend against that? It's a chilling thought that they are studying our warfare, uh, much like we might study the Egyptian charioteers. It doesn't surprise me one bit that they would be interested in such thing. The UFO incident in Vietnam forces the US military to reassess their policy of engaging with UFOs. So here's what's interesting about this encounter. After it occurred, US command ordered their fighter pilots and naval ships not to fire on UFOs. They did not want a repeat of that deadly incident. Situation now is that we do not engage UFOs and try to bring them down. As a matter of fact, I've talked to a number of aircraft controllers who told me that they're told that whenever one of our aircraft sees the UFO is to divert it away, in other words, to avoid any kind of a confrontation that they feel that it's important to stay away from them as much as possible. When you consider that the most powerful military power in the world has been humbled by these events, it really makes you wonder what's going on behind the scenes and how they're viewing them. If the government creates actual protocols for dealing with UFOs, why go to such great lengths to cover up their very existence? You would think that they couldn't put the genie back in the bottle at this point, but that's exactly what they tried to do. Since Roswell, there have been many UFO conspiracy theorists who believe that the lid on the government's UFO reports has been kept firmly shut. But over half a century later, one man decides to shine a light on the truths that he claims the government is hiding. London, 2001. Systems Administrator Gary McKinnon is at home attempting to hack into NASA computers. He believes these files hold secrets, secrets he's not supposed to have access to. Gary McKinnon was fascinated by UFOs, convinced that there was a cover-up of UFOs, and in all of his available time, tried to find his way into various US uh, military websites and databases to look for information pertaining to this. 
McKinnon begins to investigate, motivated by testimony attributed to a former NASA employee. McKinnon claimed that he was looking for information that corroborated testimony given by former NASA employee Donna Hare. While working at the Johnson Space Center, she claimed she saw photos processed by the NASA Photo Lab that include UFOs. And according to her, NASA had a protocol in place where they would airbrush out UFOs before releasing these photos to the public. Thousands of miles away, McKinnon uses his computer to hunt for evidence of these UFO photos. I used various network commands to strip out the machines that were in Building 8 and uh, got onto those. And one day he hit pay dirt at the website of US Space Command and got in there. And the very first one I was on um, literally had what she said. I can't remember if it was filtered and raw, processed and unprocessed, but there was definitely folders whereby there was a transformation in the data taking place between one and the other. One of the, maybe the key things Gary McKinnon claimed that he saw were a series of folders of um, filtered and unfiltered NASA images. So the unfiltered images, he said, contained space-based images from NASA missions of um, really extraordinary types of UFOs. Uh, the filtered versions of those were of the same images with those craft scrubbed out, clean, nothing in there. But Gary McKinnon's findings don't end there. When Gary McKinnon hacked NASA, he found this high-definition picture of a cigar-shaped craft hovering above the northern hemisphere. And you had the Earth's hemisphere, I think about two-thirds of the screen, and then halfway between the top of the hemisphere and the bottom of the picture, there was a, a classic sort of cigar-shaped object. As McKinnon continues to scour the files, he makes an even more shocking discovery. He claims to have seen a roster on military data boards indicating space-based assets that we currently have in space now. Gary McKinnon found evidence of United States spaceships and non-terrestrial officers. There was um, an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, the title was non-terrestrial officers. Then it had names, ranks. And the other thing was a list of um, ship-to-ship and fleet-to-fleet -fleet transfers. Now, bear in mind, fleet-to-fleet, -fleet, so multiple ships. Um, of materials, and these ships weren't, you know, U.S. Navy ships. Is it possible that Gary McKinnon stumbled upon evidence of a fleet of top-secret spacecrafts that were part of a covert space weapons program? Rumors of a secret military program have been floating around UFO circles for a while. Suddenly, here's Gary McKinnon claiming he's found proof of its existence. The space fleet McKinnon reportedly discovers is believed by many to be part of a top secret program named Solar Warden. Solar Warden is supposedly a highly classified fleet that operates in space and uses anti-gravity technology. My surmise that um, an off-planet sort of space marines is being formed. And a lot of the government, uh, space command stuff, it's all about space dominance, you know, and it is, you know, the final frontier. So I think um, it's, it's natural for them to want to control space and be developing a space going forward and secret. If true, McKinnon's apparent discovery of a highly advanced U.S. space fleet would challenge the public's knowledge of UFOs and the U.S. space program. There are reports that Solar Warden has eight cigar-shaped UFOs that are larger than two football fields end to end. It also reportedly has 43 small scout ships. So what he saw is suggestive, at least in the opinion of some people, that this is another piece of evidence for a secret space program. Could the United States really have a secret space fleet hidden in orbit? And if so, could Solar Warden be part of a larger top secret space weapons program, one that could patrol space and protect us against otherworldly threats? Whatever the case may be, there are consequences when such a massive breach of security occurs. In March 2002, Gary McKinnon was arrested on charges of hacking into NASA and Pentagon computers in what they refer to as the biggest military hack of all time. I've made full and frank admissions all the way down to police interviews, um, but yes, I did obtain unauthorized access to these systems. 
The 46-year-old admits actually hacking the computers. He doesn't deny that at all. But he wasn't trying to breach national security. He was simply looking for information about UFOs. For 10 years, Gary McKinnon faced extradition and prosecution in the United States for his national security breach. The charges were eventually dropped. But what McKinnon uncovered might provide evidence that in addition to NASA actively concealing UFOs, there may also be indications of a secret sophisticated space weapons program. But without government confirmation, McKinnon's findings are far from proven. Secrecy, deception, masterful cover-ups. In the world of UFO phenomena, many believe that a secret government operation is in place to silence the believers and witnesses. These are just the cases we know about from those who were brave enough to come forward. But what about the ones we never get to hear? How many others are out there with similar experiences but too afraid to report them? With all roads leading back to Roswell, this supposed pattern of denial. Its mandate was not to explain UFO sightings. It was to explain them away. And sometimes, intimidation. What they want is for the public to keep going about their business and not ask any questions about UFOs. All begs the question, do we have more secrets than answers? And when will the truth finally be uncovered.